Philip and Lowry and Miss Payton and thank you, choir and fellas. We're going to be uh, looking at the title of the message this morning is A Gracious Father. We're going to be looking at probably the most familiar of all the parables in the scriptures. It comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 11 through 32. A woman uh, went to the police station with her next door neighbor uh, to report that her husband had been missing for two weeks. Now, <clears throat> the police officer said, well, listen, we, we, we need a description of him. And so she said, well, he's 35 years old, six foot two, dark eyes, dark wavy hair. An athletic build, weighs 185 pounds, is soft-spoken, and is good to the children. About that time, the neighbor lady spoke up, and she said, How can you tell such a lie? Wait a minute. Your husband is five foot four, chubby, bald, has a big mouth, and is mean to the children. And the wife replied, Sure, but who wants him back? <laughs> Family problems. <laughs> We're going to look at a man who really had some family problems. And uh, I think that we can understand that this is a gracious father. And, and that this father had done all the things that he should have done as a father in trying to raise up his two sons. Uh, but as most parents find out sooner or later, there's no guarantee about how our children will turn out in the end. No guarantee at all. And when we look back at the very beginning in, in the book of Genesis, what do we find back there? The first two sons didn't turn out the way you might want because one killed the other. One was right, the other one wasn't. And you know, the thing is, is that God himself warned that son and told him that sin was crouching at his doorstep, waiting to pounce on him, and that he needed to take care and not let that happen. But he did. He did. So there, there's no guarantee. No guarantee whatsoever. We don't know how much our kids are going to love us or care about us. In fact, they may not only leave us, they may reject us. And boy, does that hurt. That really hurts. Now, Jesus told this parable about a father. He had two sons. And the father was rejected by the one son. And then later, when that relationship was restored... The other son rejected him. Let's read. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him 
anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's look at the rejection of the sons and the grace of the father. And first, the rejection of the younger son. We don't have any idea whatsoever why the younger son rejected his father and his father's way of life. But he did just that. The young man didn't come from a poor family. He wasn't a down and outer. Instead, he came from a, a fairly well-off family. The point is, since life really was good for him, why did he do it? Why did he leave? You know, we have some cliches where people attempt and try to, to explain such things because people do these things, and we often wonder why. Some say, well, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, which simply means that, hey, over yonder looks a lot better than right here. And some say, well... You know, he's got to go out and sow his wild oats. He's got to go out and there's, there's this, this wildness about him. He's got to get out of him. Others called it uh, the wanderlust. And uh, I can remember when I was a boy, there was a song out called The Wayward Wind. And uh, the, man, the singer said, and, and, and I was born next of kin to the wayward wind. Because he wanted to wander. Just to wander. And some people are that way. Or maybe the simple truth is that he wanted to live this, his way and not his father's way. You know, that's one of the things that we all have a tendency to do. And that is, 
to reject other people's rules over us, even if those other people happen to be our parents. Now, perhaps it had to do with a, a lack of appreciation for his father and a lack of appreciation for his father's wisdom and experience. Mark Twain once said, you know, when I was 16 years old, my daddy was the dumbest man in the world. But by the time that I was 21, he had gained so much smarts. There is that realization that there is a time in our lives when we do think that our parents are pretty dumb. And then there comes a time in our lives when we realize they weren't so dumb after all. So who knows? It may have been a combination of all these things. Whatever the cause may have been, we can really only speculate. So let's look at some facts then. This young man confronted his father. And he didn't, if you'll notice, he didn't ask. He confronted him. He said, Dad, I want my share of my inheritance. And I want it now. Now the truth of the matter is, the young man had no right to his inheritance until the father died. Not at all. Nevertheless, the father granted his demand and he gave him his share. Now, it, it kind of says here that it says, not long afterward, which kind of implies that he didn't leave immediately. There was a slight pause in time. But not much, because it wasn't long before he gathered up everything he owned, all that he had, and took it with him. Now listen, there's a certain air of finality about the way it says this. When he took everything he owned. You see, he's cutting off all the ties between himself and home. He's cutting all the ties between himself and his father. And as we often say, he was burning his bridges behind him. Eliminating everything that might draw him back home. And then it says he went away to a far-off country. He wanted to get as far away from home as possible, as far away from daddy as possible. You know, <clears throat> when we know that we're not doing right, we don't want to be where daddy can hear about it or where mama can interfere with our lifestyle. We want to get away. And we find that happening sometimes when young people go off to college. They don't come home very much. Maybe except to do some laundry. They don't want their parents to interfere with them anymore. They enjoy the newfound freedom. And the freedom sometimes causes them to turn wild. And they become flower children and hippies. Or their quest for adventure causes them to join the Symbionese Liberation Army. Or today we might call it ISIS. The far country for this young man. was somewhere that daddy couldn't find him and daddy couldn't hear about him. And then what was bound to happen to such a reckless young man happened. 
He squandered all of his money on wild living. I like the sound of that word squander. Squander. You see, it means to take that which is precious and waste it. Waste it. Taking that which has value and throwing it away. This young man was a real waster. And, and you know, the strange thing is, is that reckless people like him can find all kinds of fair weather friends to help them spend their money. But when the money's gone, so are the friends. And that's the way it was with him. And he found himself without a friend. Not a friend in this world. And there he is in Gentile territory all by himself. What was he going to do? He was all alone. Well, I guess I'll get a job. Boy, what kind of jobs was he qualified for and what kind did he get? So he went to a, a Gentile and hired himself out to him. And guess what kind of job that Gentile gave him? He gave him a job that smelled to Jews. They didn't like it. He was now in charge of the pigsty. He was taking care of the hogs and feeding them. And if that wasn't bad enough, he looked at what the hogs were eating and it was starting to look good. And he wanted some of what they were eating. And then he came to his senses and he woke up and he said, Hey, it doesn't have to be this way. I don't have to stay here. My father's servants have plenty to eat. They're in good shape. My, I, I, I'd just like to go home and be one of my father's servants. So he, he started practicing his speech and what he was going to say. He practiced. And on the way back, he practiced. He says, I'm just going to tell Daddy, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but I'd sure like to be one of your hired hands. Could you please just let me be one of your servants? And of course, he practiced. His father saw him a great distance away, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But his father saw him a great distance away, and his father ran out to him. And they were reconciled to one another. The father threw his arms around the boy, even before the boy could say a word. And as his father put his arms around him, the son said his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be your son, but I'd sure like to be one of your servants. And the father immediately did what? He immediately said, hey, go get me an old dirty robe out of the house. No! He said, go get me the best robe that we've got. And he put it on the boy. And he took a ring, a symbol of sonship, and he stuck it on his finger. And he said, put some shoes on this boy. He's been going barefoot long enough. <laughs> Sounds like your preacher. <laughs> going barefoot long enough. The father is no longer rejected by this son. And he told them also, go get that fattened calf and let's, let's kill it and let's celebrate. 
because this son of mine who was lost is now home. Time for celebration. No longer rejected by the younger son. But now, suddenly, he's going to be rejected by the older son. The one that's been with him all this time. The one who seemed to be loyal and true blue. The one who was non-rebellious, at least so we thought. And suddenly we find out that all along he has spurned his father's way of life as well. It was true that he was upset because of the grace his father was showing to his wastrel brother. But the animosity toward this brother, which was obvious, changed. And he became angry, refused to join the celebration. And we find out very soon that when his father went out to see him, that the real source of the boy's anger came out. And it was like the fellow pointing his finger. And he said, Daddy, it's you that I'm mad at. I'm angry with you, Dad. No way am I joining this celebration for that wayward son of yours. And so he poured out all of his grievances toward the dad. All of them. They were cutting words. Cutting to his father. And we find that this son was even more rebellious than the other son. But his rebellion wasn't open, outward rebellion at first. Like his brothers. This was the silent, festering kind of rebellion. <clears throat> he didn't stay home with his father all these years because he loved his father. In fact, he resented working for his father. It was drudgery. He felt like he was slaving for his father. And he felt like he was never rewarded for his work or for his obedience. And it just seemed unfair to him that this father of his, the way he had treated him all these years by never giving him a goat or letting him celebrate with his friends, was now killing that fattened calf for his wayward brother. The one who took his father's money and wasted it on wild living and women. I think the older brother probably wishes he was out there. That's the way it seems. You see, the older brother didn't expect his father to show this kind of grace to the prodigal brother. Not at all. No. Instead, he expected the father to get even with the boy. To get even. But he didn't. He expected the father to reject this other son. But he didn't. Now the parable ends with an explanation by the father. He said, we had to celebrate because this brother of yours was lost but now is found. Now we've got to understand this parable, <clears throat> this one along with the two that were before it were spoken because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were muttering to themselves and to other people about Jesus 
welcoming and eating with tax collectors and sinners. Now before we go on too far with that, let's look at one other element of the parable. And that's the one of the rejected father, the gracious father. The first son rejected the father because he was a little too demanding maybe. Or simply because he just wanted to be in charge of himself and he didn't want to answer to anybody. And the father, the father knew the folly of all of this. But he let his son go to find out for himself. With no guarantee of ever seeing that son again. Don't you know that that just breaks a father's heart? It always breaks a father's heart when his children seem rebellious and wayward. Still, this father not only left the door open so that his son could return, but he kept an eye out. He kept looking down that road hoping to see his son return. And when he did, the father ran out to him, threw his arms around him, and was happy and gracious to that boy. Especially when he saw that son coming back with a repentant spirit rather than an in-your-face spirit. Also, the father fully restored this boy to the family, completely. Jesus was trying to tell those Pharisees, God is gracious, and God wants to restore all who are lost. And it doesn't matter how they lived. It doesn't matter what they did. It doesn't matter the shape that they're in. What matters is that they turn back to the Father. That's what matters. Also, we understand something. The Pharisees were very stubborn, and so were the teachers of the law. And they didn't understand, truly, the nature of God. They didn't understand about God's gracious, forgiving nature. They were kind of like that older brother. The one that the father was not rejecting. But who was rejecting the father? You see, the thing is, is Jesus wanted them to know, hey, the father still loves you. The father is still extending you grace. He's extending you the same grace that is extending to those people who are lost. And you may not realize it, but you need that grace just as well. You need that grace. And when the matter comes down to it, we all need His grace. Every single one of us. Whether or not we have gone astray, whether or not we've remained faithful. We need His grace. We can't save ourselves. We need His grace. Now the parable ends without us knowing if the elder brother accepted the Father's grace. But today, we know that many of the Pharisees did accept God's grace and did become a part of the church because they're mentioned in Acts chapter 15 and verse 5. So listen. All of this is meant 
to be instruction for us.